Thank you so much for being here tonight. Glad everybody is here, and it's a big deal to me when everyone comes on a, on a Wednesday night. If you got a work week or a you know a busy week, and you make make the effort to, to scarf some dinner down real quick and get here, so I appreciate you guys uh, being here tonight. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Jude. I'm going to use that as kind of a springboard. And as uh, Pastor Keith talked about, we're going to be talking about Mormonism tonight, and again next week. And uh, I plan on uh, tonight trying to cover the ground of, of the history of where the Mormon church came from and kind of some of the, the, the problems with some of their beliefs. And, and I'm not sure how much time we'll be able to get into some of that, but we'll, we'll try to get into some of their belief system a little bit. And then next week, we'll look at their version of the plan of salvation and how we can, how we can try to, to reach them for the true gospel. Um, so uh, you got the, the book of Jude. You know, actually, uh, Pastor Keith was talking about the uh, unbelievable night coming up this, this Saturday. We're looking forward to, to being a part of that. And what, what truly is going to be unbelievable is when Allison is doing all this stuff and I decide to take two hours just to take a nap somewhere. <laughs> just kidding. I won't do that. I'm, hel- I'm helping, dear. I, I'll, I'll be there. So, but uh, actually, uh, Allison and I, we, we learned a long time ago that uh, we work very, very well together when uh, our motto is we work well together separately. And uh, so when, when we were in youth ministry, there was certain things that I would do and I would delegate some things to her for her to do. And we would b- do both of these at the same times, but we would not cross each other's paths while we're doing these independent things. So if you notice in children's ministries, like some things look like Allison is doing some things that I'm doing and we're like one of the two the same, but just working together separately. So uh, we, I, I would like to definitely say that I cannot do what I do without her. Um, I don't know if it's the other way around that she could do all the things that she does without me, but, uh, <laughs> but we're a good team. I appreciate her and, and all that she does too. So, all right, book of Jude, let's get into this. Uh, Jude, uh, verse number three, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. And there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to the condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in this this verse, uh, I'm going to actually read the same passage again at the end of the message tonight. Um, just to kind of bring it full circle. But as, as Judas is, is writing this, he's talking about to earnestly contend for the faith. And he's charging Christians that have been given the truth to contend for it, to fight for it, to defend it, to uphold it. And he tells them to contend for the faith. And it talks about what this faith that we're contending for, contending for it says it was once delivered. Once delivered unto the saints. So in other words, this this faith that has been given, this gospel that has been given, this truth that has been given, it is not a progressional truth. It is not something that is constantly being revealed or or is changing over time. It was giving once, and that's what it's to contend for. And uh, I want you to put a note there, because that's going to come to be a very important point later on in the message uh, this evening. Then it goes on to say, too, in verse 4, it says that these people that were crept in unawares, these ungodly men, it says that they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, the the pure gospel of of, of grace, of salvation by grace through faith, it is being corrupted, it is being muddied, it is being... Uh, it is being uh, stirred up and, and taken away from the pure, pureness of God's grace. Uh, we'll see that in what's taking place probably more next week. And then it also talks about here, it says, uh, denying these people, these ungodly people are denying the only, I have that underlined in my Bible, the only Lord God. So one singular God. And we'll see tonight that they're, they have a religion of more than one, one God. And so um, this is what we're supposed to be contending for. And, and as we kind of dig deeper into this, we'll read this passage again. And some of these, these main points in that verse will kind of pop out more uh, to you as we read that again. So um, this journey of discovering what Mormons believe or Latter-day Saints believe 
really kind of started about four weeks ago for me. And I started uh, in, about a, in the middle of September. I really started searching online. I started looking at, okay, what do, what do Mormons believe? What, what are they all about? And, and so you start looking at different articles. You start looking on YouTube. And you, have, you really kind of have it on both ends of the spectrum. You have those that are Mormons and t- t- telling their slant on, on what they believe. And you have those that are anti-Mormons and t- kind of hearing their slant. And it's like I, I really couldn't find what... What do they really, truly believe? And, and so it was uh, on September 23rd, it was a Monday, and I was like, all right, I, I need to talk to somebody in person. I need to talk to a real live Mormon in person and, and just ask them questions. You know, what's it all about? So I uh, did a Google search, and there is a Latter-day Saint church. If you go down uh, Cheviot Road and you go towards um, the Mumford Heights area and you go past the uh, Mercy West Hospital, there's a Latter-day Saint church that's right there. And so I called that church, and I said, hey, I want to talk to somebody. Can, can someone make me a Mormon? You know, like trying to you know, give them a hook on something to try and talk to me. So they're like... Um, they're, they're like, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we, we have someone that can, can talk to you, and we'll get, they took down my, uh, my name and my number, and I didn't hear anything. So I went on their website, the Latter-day Saint website, and they had a thing, if you wanted to have a missionary contact you, fill out your information. So I put up my, my name, my phone number, my email, my address, everything short of my social security number, just to try and get them to contact me. And I submitted it, and then, and then there was an automated text message that came to me and an automated email that came to me. And in that automated email, it gave me like a contact person for an elder. So I emailed the elder. I said, hey, I want to talk to someone. I want, I want to become a Mormon. You know, like, please, somebody talk to me. You know, and, and so um, he gave me the, the cell phone number for one of their missionaries. Um, and so I tried calling them, and I didn't hear back. So the, the next day, uh, with all the patience that I have, I went and I drove to the church. And I walked inside, and I said, can I talk to somebody? <laughs> and so uh, they're like, yeah, uh, I talked to you yesterday. Let me get your name and number and I have, I have someone contact you. And it's like, all right. So, uh, so they did finally call. And, and I told them, I was like, uh, let's, let's, let's text. Let's, let's do by text message so we can kind of go back and forth. So we went back and forth and it was uh, that, that Friday we finally got together and I scheduled a time to, to meet with these, these Mormon missionaries and we met at the church and they gave me a tour of the church. They walked me around and there was three of them. There was three uh, Mormon missionaries that were there. And as they toured the church, as you would go in there, it looked very similar to our church, just on a smaller section. It was probably about the size of, of just this section here, um, maybe just a little bit bigger than that, but not by much. And uh, they had a, a, uh, an altar in the front, they had a, the podium in the front, they had a choir loft in the back. The only thing that was a little bit different was over on this side, they had very, very similar to when we had our Lord's Supper service, we had the white tablecloth. They had a white tablecloth where they would do their, their version of the Lord's Supper. And every Sunday they would do, do the Lord's Supper. Um, and then they had a gymnasium in the back and they actually had a baptistry in the back over there. And they had Sunday school classes on the sides. But if you were to go into, into this church, it would look like any other Christian church that you would kind of, kind of expect. And so that's what it, what it looked like. And so um, we ended up uh, sitting in one of the side classrooms. We ended up having a two-hour conversation, uh, just asking questions and trying to understand. And after, after the end of two hours, uh, I just kind of told him, I said, hey, I have so many more questions. Can we talk some more? And so they said, yeah. And so we made the deal. It's like, okay, I visited your church. Will you visit my church? And so next, the, the following week, they came and we sat, actually, Brother Dave, where you are, we sat right in that section there and we, we talked for another two hours. I gave them a tour of our church and just were, were digging into what they were talking about. And then later on that same evening, I went over to, to Miss Suzette's house and her son-in-law uh, was raised up as a Mormon over in Utah and had uh, come to realize that it was not the truth and, and, and left the Mormon faith and became a Christian and drilled him with a whole bunch of questions for like another two hours. And, and, uh, and, and it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a great conversation. And I, I don't remember what kind of cake that was that, that night, but it was amazing. So, um, but, uh, uh, but it was, that was kind of been my journey of trying to, to research all this stuff with, with, with Mormonism. And, um, 
what I found out towards the end of my second, second time talking to these, these, these Mormons in, in about four hours of conversation, I was always referring to them as Mormons, they finally spoke up at the end. It's like, you know, actually, uh, it's kind of offensive if you call us Mormons. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this at the beginning? So they prefer to be called Latter-day Saints. Um, apparently, there was some sort of thing in 2018 where they made some sort of decree, like, uh, we're no longer to be referring to ourselves as Mormons, but Latter-day Saints, um, whereas prior to that, they actually took a lot of pride in that name. So um, that kind of changed a little bit. So tonight, I will either refer to them Latter-day Saints or LDS or Mormons, but it, I'm not using it in a kind of derogatory type uh, way. It just is a lot quicker to say the word Mormon as compared to Latter-day Saints over and over and over. So... Um, so that was kind of my journey. So tonight, what I would like to, to do is start off with like, where, where did this Latter-day Saint church come from? What's the history of that? And then after we get into that, we're going to kind of look at how did the Book of Mormon come about, and, and what, we'll dig a little bit deeper in, into that. So really to kind of begin this story, we have to go back, go back about 2,600 years. Um, to about 600, a, uh, or 600 BC, uh, right, right before the Israelites went into the Babylonian captivity. Now, according to uh, the, the Mormon belief system, uh, there was, and this is all in the Book of Mormon and some of their books that they have, uh, there was a prophet by the name of Lehi. And Lehi was, was a prophet, and he brought his family to the Americas. Uh, before the Babylonian captivity took place. And they, they ventured into this new world, and he brought his family with him. And he had two sons. One was the son of, of Nephi, and the other one was Laman. Uh, and so these two sons, Nephi was righteous and Laman was wicked. And so Nephi and his family became the Nephites, and Laman and his family, which were the wicked ones, became the Lamanites. And so here in the Americas, the, the Nephites and the Lamanites were constantly at war with each other. They were constantly fighting, and for centuries they were fighting. And so because, uh, because of the, the wickedness of the Lamanites, God actually had put a curse uh, on them and gave them darker skin, according to their, their, to their book. And that is where what they say was where the Indonesians came from and where the American Indians came from. That is their explanation and how these people got to the Americas. Well, in this time of, of, of all these battles, we kind of fast forward a little bit to uh, 311, uh, 385 AD. There is a man that comes into the scene by, uh, through the family line of the Nephites by the prophet Mormon. Uh, Mormon. Uh, was, was a prophet to them, and he was the one that was given these very, quote-unquote, valuable historical records on these very thin golden plates. And he comes up with these golden plates with, with this, with this important historical uh, documents that, that we'll see that's in the Book of Mormon. And as this battle was raging on for, for these centuries, Mormon had a son that was uh, named Moroni, and Moroni took these golden plates and he buried them in, in the ground to keep them safe from being destroyed from the Lamanites. And so he buried them in some undisclosed location in upstate New York. And so uh, time passes by and for centuries, these golden plates were safely buried underground and really kind of forgotten about until about the 1800s uh, in 1805 where Joseph Smith is born in Vermont. And when Joseph Smith was 14 years old in 1820, he got to a point in his life where he was confused about which religion was right. And in his time of confusion, he goes out into the woods and he begins to pray. And he said, he's asking God, you know, there's all these different denominations. There's all these different, different types of religions. And he's praying to God, which one is right? Well, God the Father and God the Son appear to him. And they, they tell Joseph Smith that none of them are correct. So he tells, he has this uh, appearance that there, there is no right religion anywhere on the face of the earth. Total apostasy. Well, uh, according to their belief system, that um, right after the apostles, after Jesus Christ ascended and the apostles died, they believed that from that point on, 
complete apostasy took place and corruption was in all the churches. And so from that moment on, there was all corrupt churches. And so Joseph Smith uh, has this, this, this revelation directly from God. Now, three years later when he's 17, he has another vision where this angel Moroni, all the way back uh, from a, a Mormon son, Moroni shows up as an angel to Joseph Smith and he tells them about the secret location of where these golden plates he buried centuries ago and tells them about his purpose that he's going to have. And so in 1827, Moroni gives Joseph Smith these golden plates. And so Moroni uh, eventually takes those plates back after he has time to transcribe them and, and translate them. And Moroni takes these plates and never to be seen ever again or ever be witnessed by anyone else. Uh, by 1830, the finished translation of the Book of Mormon, which is what, what is right here, is, is, was complete. And the, uh, the official uh, uh, Jesus Christ Church, as they would call it, was finally restored and recognized at, upon the earth in 1830. Joseph Smith becomes the first prophet of the Mormon Church. And in 1844, Joseph Smith is killed in Illinois and is considered a martyr. And then in 1847, Brigham Young uh, brings all the re remaining Mormons to Utah and Salt Lake City. And to this day, that becomes the headquarters of where the Mormon Church is, is located. So that is kind of the history on how they came to be, uh, according to the Mormons. Um, a, a lot of that stuff is, is not verifiable. Um, two, two foundations for the, the Mormon religion. Uh, first thing is, is that there was complete corruption of the church after Jesus, ascended, uh, after Jesus ascended and the first apostles died. That's the first premise that they kind of build their, their whole framework on. The second thing they build it on is that Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and the Latter-day Saint Church is the restoration of that true church. So those, those two principles hinge the whole purpose of this Latter-day Church. So what about the, the, the Mormon Church today, or this Latter-day Saint Church today? Well, today, from their humble beginnings, about 200 years later, they are, they are one of the most wealthiest religious organizations in the world. Under assets, they have uh, over $265 billion in their organization. Um, they have made their money by, uh, by, uh, by uh, tithing, increasing their membership, uh, investing, and in real estate. They say just from, from the, their mandatory 10% tithe, they bring in about $7 billion per year based on uh, all, all the people that are part of the, the Mormon religion. Um, sort of the hierarchy structure, they have at uh, the very top of the pinnacle of, the, of their structure, they have someone that's called the president or the prophet. And this person is, is considered very similar to the Catholic Pope. Um, that is kind of like the hierarchy of this person. Under, uh, he has two counselors that he chooses that are his two, two uh, uh, wing people. And then they have 12 apostles underneath them. And then there's the, the 70, just sort of like you see in, and when Jesus sent out the 70, they have their own version of the 70 that they have that oversee different things. And then they have some general officers that oversee Sunday school, relief efforts, young men, young women, and the bishopric, which, which they call their pastor's bishops. And with that being said, there's uh, currently today, there's 31,000 different uh, uh, congregations or Latter-day Saint churches amongst the world and 17 million members worldwide. And uh, of, of those 17 million members, 90,000 of those members are actually active missionaries that do a two-year uh, missionary uh, stint where they dedicate two years of their life to just spreading the gospel of, 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 of their church. Uh, the three missionaries that I met uh, a few weeks ago were kind of dedicated for the Western Hills type area. That was their territory. And they told me the triangle of Northern Kentucky, Dayton, and Batesville, in that triangle, there are currently right now 200 Mormon missionaries in our area that are proselytizing and trying to share their faith. 
Um, in addition to that, the Mormon faith has four colleges or universities that has 750,000 students already enrolled. And they also have temples. So not only do they have these uh, 31,000 uh, church, church buildings, they also have special temples that are built in, in different locations for, uh, for special type um, ceremonies that they do. So they have an endowment ceremony, which is something that they do that makes covenants to, to God. They do baptisms for the dead. They do eternal marriages and sealings, and they do different washings and anointings in these temples. Now, if, if you were to look at these temples, it is, it is a completely white building with like uh, these pointy pillars that are on, on the top. There are 200 temples that are active in operation worldwide. There are 50 temples that are being under construction, and there's 100 additional temples that have been announced and are going to be yet to begin construction. And try, trying to hit home a little bit, uh, in April of this year, they announced that they're going to be building a temple in Cincinnati in the Mason area. Uh, they already have the plot of land purchased, and if you want to Google it, it is on the corner of Mason Montgomery and uh, Cedar Village Drive. And they have that, um, if you actually look at Google Maps, it already has it pinpointed as a future uh, temple for, for the Mormon church. And so, um, so that's kind of where they are today. Uh, so let's look today at, at now at the, the Book of Mormon, the book itself, because as we kind of have been talking about with with the Jehovah's Witnesses, when we've been talking about uh, the Is uh, with Islam, all of these different religions, there's always a secondary book or there's some sort of um, doctoring or, or manipulation of the, the, the truth of the Bible. And so what you saw with Jehovah's Witnesses, they had their New World Translation where they changed all the different verses to match their doctrine. Uh, with the, with the Isla Islamic faith, they have their, their the Quran that they've used to add to help interpret what the Bible will say. And now with the Book of Mormon, they have this to kind of uh, reinterpret what the Bible will say. And they have a few other books that we'll look at as well. Um, all right, so in the Book of Mormon, there is uh, 6,607 verses in the Book of Mormon, which is slightly smaller than the New Testament. So it's in, in comparison of size, uh, there's about 7,957 verses in the New Testament. So a little bit smaller than, than our New Testament. Uh, there is a lot of repetition, as I've kind of was looking into it, there's a lot of repetition in, in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and what I mean by that, uh, there's like, for an example, the, the, the name of Jesus is referred to a lot in, in, in the Book of Mormon. It is, uh, Jesus is referred to 3,925 times out of the 6,607 verses in the Book of Mormon. So if you break that down, one out of every two verses in the Book of Mormon has the name of Jesus in it. Uh, another phrase that comes up a lot is the phrase, it came to pass. That phrase shows up 1,165 times. And if you look at that, well, one out of every five verses has the phrase, it came to pass, which means 2.5% of the Book of Mormon is the phrase, it came to pass. I just thought that was kind of funny. But um, the, the other thing, too, with, with this is the, the Book of Mormon actually contains a lot of scripture references of the King James Bible. There is 971 verses of the King James Bible that are quoted in the Book of Mormon. Um, and actually, uh, it's about 14% of the Book of Mormon is actually the Bible. And they took 19 full chapters out of the Book of Isaiah and, and copied into there. That's 478 verses from the Book of Isaiah that they put in there. The thing that's very interesting, as I was kind of studying this, so I read a, read a couple chapters in here, and if, if you're familiar with, with the King James Bible, um, whenever the Bible was, was quoted in the Book of Mormon, they, they immediately jump out at you. And it was interesting that every time a verse in the Bible was quoted, it was grossly taken out of context to try to say something or make some kind of point that was not the purpose of why that was actually put into the Bible in the first place. And so... You, you see that the Book of Mormon does try to retranslate things and, and to build, build its, its own, own type of a thought process. Um, another thing that is interesting, according to, 
to their, to their legend, the Book of Mormon, we remember it came off of golden plates. These golden uh, plates and pages uh, would have been, been transcribed before the Bible, especially the New Testament, was ever even written. And so when you see that, that the Book of Mormon was written before the Bible, and there are um, over 971 verses of the King James Bible in the Book of Mormon, you have to come to one of two conclusions. Either one, it is a miraculous thing that God in all of his consistency was able to uh, match uh, the verses in the Book of Mormon that was before it was even breathed into the New Testament and it was a supernatural thing to where uh, God had just consistently had all the Book of Mormon and the King James Bible to, to uh, agree with one another in that, in that regard. Or it is possible that there was this guy named Joseph Smith That as he was writing his own Bible or own Book of Mormon, he had his King James and he was copying from the pages. I happen to believe that that version of it. Um, The other thing with the Book of Mormon is that we talked about it is a, uh, what they say is a a valuable historical book. And so they, they, they have a lot of reference to different types of people groups and different types of locations that you do not find anywhere else. So in other words, you, there's, there's people groups like the Nephites and the, the Lamanites. You don't find any other history books uh, or any kind of secular uh, documents that talk about these people. The only place that you see these people talked about are in Mormon literature. Um, there are some locations that they talk about that you don't see any archaeological evidence or any kind of, uh, of evidence of these places ever existing. And, and, and so in contrast with the Bible, when you look at the Old Testament, when you look at the New Testament, there are verifiable locations. When you guys, uh, some of you guys went to the Holy Land and you saw the different holy sites where Jesus actually was. Like all the places where, where, where Jesus went to uh, around Capernaum and, and, and where he was crucified, you still 2,000 years later, you can still see those locations. They're there. Um, when you talk about the Roman government, that was an actual civilization that existed. Even back in the Old Testament, the Babylonians, the, the Persian Empire, the Egyptians, those are actual places that other external sources outside the Bible verify that those things and those places, those people actually existed. When it comes to the Book of Mormon, you don't have any of that. Um, there, it's all fairy tales made up in, in, in the book that they, that they have there. Um, so as, as we look into this, there's, there's some contradictions with, with, um, with what the Bible says and what the Book of Mormon says. So I'm going to quiz you with a couple things to see how much you guys know with, about what the Bible says. So um, <clears throat> question number one, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. All right. If you were to read Alma 7 verse 10 in the Book of Mormon, it tells you that Jesus was born in Jerusalem. Not the same place. Um, how long was darkness over the earth when Jesus was, was being crucified? Three hours. Over all the earth, there was darkness. Uh, according to Hellman 1420, as it talks about Jesus being crucified, it says that it was three days of darkness all across the earth. Um, when we're saved, are we saved by grace alone? Or do we need to be saved by grace and we have to do something to help it? It's grace alone. Romans eleven sixteen 16 says, and if by grace, then there's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Uh, Second Nephi uh, 25, 23, it says, it is by grace that we are saved. Sounds good. There's a comma after all we can do. So they have grace and works mingled together. So there's some, some very quick high-level overview of some contradictions that are there. Um, 
want to kind of dig deeper what, what their final authorities are. So if you were to talk to a Mormon and ask them, okay, what is your final authority? What, what do you base all your beliefs on? There's five different areas where they'll, they'll base their, their final authority. One is, is the King James Bible. They, they do not see any other version of the Bible as valid, they, only the King James. Uh, they use King James. They use the Book of Mormon. They use another book called Doctrine and Covenants and another book called The Pearl of Great Price. Those four books are the four books of, of the foundation of their belief system. The other, the other um, um, foundation that they, they will use for their belief system is modern day revelation. At the, if you remember about the hierarchy, we talked about the prophet and the, the 12 apostles. They believe that what they speak is modern day revelation. So what they speak, they will they will add that to the, to the foundation of, of, what, of what they believe. Um, they, they, when I asked them if they believed in miracles, they said that they did, um, but they did not have any substantial examples um, of, of a type of miracle that, that they have seen or heard of. Um, and then they also talked about, because I asked them, I said, well, what if, a, what if a prophet speaks some new truth that is contrary to what something else that you already believe in? And they said them as a people, they talked about they, they are really big on leaning on their feelings. Does it, does it feel right? Does, is, and it, it refers to the example with, um, with uh, the men that were on the, the road to Damascus and Jesus was talking to them and then how in their heart it did burn within them when Jesus talked to them. They talk about a burning in, the, in their bosom. And it says if it's true, there'll be this burning in their bosom that verifies that what is said is true. Um, and actually, it was, the, it was the first time I was talking with them. It was about an hour and a half into the conversation when I was at their church, and I was just kind of just drilling them with these questions. And they got to a point where it's like, they were like, hey, there's been times where, I, where, where God has just spoken to me, and I have really felt God spe- speaking to me. And it, it was like a peace, a peace and a joy that, that was just deep inside. And they asked the other missionary, have you ever t- had a time where, where you, have, you felt like God was speaking to you? And it's like, yeah, there was a time where I, I had this confirmation in my mind. And they, and they went to the other person and said, did you ever feel like there was a time where God spoke to me? He's like, yeah, and he ex- explained about how he felt when God spoke to me. And then he looked at me and he's like, do you, do you, has there been a time where you have felt God speak to you? And I was like, the only thing I feel right now is really awkward. <laughs> like, like, no, like I, I'm, I'm very cerebral. Uh, and it's like, I, I, I read, I, I understand, and I believe. It's not always based on a feeling. It, we're supposed to, to trust the Lord with all of our heart, but also based on our mind. Uh, and talks about being, uh, let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. and Let our mind be conformed to, to Christ. And so there, there, there is this, knowledge of understanding, but also a heart behind it, but there's not always a feeling that follows with it. So, um, so it's very dangerous to be following a feeling because feelings uh, flutter, go up and down, and they can deceive you very easily. So, um, so those are the things that they find their foundation of what they believe in. Now, what I would like to do at this point, I think for sake of time, this is probably what I'm probably going to end on, not really getting deep into, into what they actually believe, but since they believe in modern revelation, I think we need to kind of pause there for a second. You know, why is it, why is it that the Bible that we hold stops at the New Testament? Because I want you to imagine, because the Bible that we have was not just given to us all at one time. It was actually, it actually progressed over time. So put yourself back in, in Moses' time frame. You really didn't have even kind of written word at that time. God is giving Moses the Ten Commandments. God has given him the, the, the first five books of the Bible. And this new revelation is now being given. Do you trust it or do you not? Well, time goes on and, and it is established that this is God's word and you get now into the kings and to the prophets and you, you have some books of the Old Testament, but now these new prophets are coming. They're doing, they're doing all these uh, miracles and these different things. And you have Isaiah and you have Daniel and you have these other prophets that are writing and they're now being added to this, this Jewish synagogue. Do you trust it? And you accept it as time goes on. 
Well, now, now you get to, to Jesus' time. And maybe you were born about 20 AD and you were able to see Jesus Christ do his miracles. You're able to see Jesus Christ be crucified and hear about uh, how he rose again. And time goes on and these different types of people like Luke and Paul and Peter begin writing some different letters and and Paul is sending stuff to to Galatia and to Ephesus and these different writings are now being adopted into these new churches that they have the Old Testament, but now they're starting to add some of these new new, uh, documents to it too. Do you accept these new new documents or, or not? But now we get to where we are today, and now we have established the 66 books that we have. Is God done speaking? Does God still give new revelation? Because he has given new revelation over time. Or is it once Jesus Christ came and he resurrected, is he done? And so according to a Mormon, They believe that God's not done giving new revelation and it's still giving new and afresh just like it was back then. And so I think we really need to to answer this question, is God done giving new revelation or is it still possible for God to give new revelations today? So I think what we want to do and what I would like to do tonight is is actually turn to these passages because I've done a lot of talking about about the Mormon faith. So go and turn to Matthew chapter 24, and I want to, I do want to slow down and make sure that we hit this right in the last 10 minutes that we have. In Matthew chapter 24, in uh, verse 42 and 44, It says, watch therefore, for ye know not what your Lord, or what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. And look at verse 44. It says, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, this is a passage talking about end times, and it is giving us something that we're supposed to be looking forward to next. In this passage, what are we, as as Jesus Christ's ministry comes to an end, what are we today supposed to be looking for next? Christ's return. And so we're not looking for a new revelation. We are looking for Jesus to come again. So that's what we're instructed to be looking for. Now, I think we need to dig deeper than that. And so um, knowing with that in mind, this is part of the reason why we know that this has come to an end. And also, uh, if you remember, we read in in, in Jude, in verse 3, it talked about contending for the faith that was once given unto the saints. Um, this, This revelation about this gospel was given once at this time. It does not need to be continually given. Um. But God gave us two ways and how we confirm that the word that is given is from him and not from somebody else. And so we're going to look at both of those things. The first first way we can know that a message uh, uh, that is from God is actually from him is number one is by from, from miracles. Go and turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. In verse number 20, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and look at this, and confirming the word with signs following. One of the ways that God confirms his new revelation, his new word that's being given, it always comes with signs and wonders and miracles. This is why when we read the Bible that it's filled with all these miracles. These miracles are not common. They don't happen all the time. That's part of the reason why they're written about. You look at the life of Moses. There was a lot of new revelation coming. 
His, his life was filled with, mo, with, with miracles when he was uh, doing, uh, doing the interactions with Pharaoh, when he was walking through the wilderness and all those things. His, his ministry was filled with, with miracles. You look at all the, the, the different uh, the judges and the different ways that God miraculously did things there in the book of Judges being written. When you look at the, the, the kings and the prophets, all the miracles that they did, they were confirming the word that was given. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ and, and the apostle Paul and the disciples, their lives were filled with miracles that followed that confirmed the new word that was given. So part of the reason why I asked the, the, the Mormon missionaries that if the prophets and apostles today do miracles it's because I was, I was curious to see if they were doing things that would confirm their new prophecy. And they, had, they said there's nothing that they could really substantially confirm. So to me, that is proof that these new revelations we're giving are not being confirmed by God with miracles. The, the second thing that God gives us to check to see if something is from him or not is, is prophecy. Go and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, this is, this is really one of the f- first texts that the Israelites were, were being given, and, and they ask a really valid question in Deuteronomy 18, verse 21 and 22. Verse 21 says, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken. So this is the question they're asking. It's like, okay, if someone speaks some sort of word from the Lord, how do I know it's not from the Lord? That's the question they're asking. And God gives them, gives, gives them the answer. It says, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So what he's saying is that if a prophet speaks something that is a future predictive prophecy and it does not come to pass, you know that is not from me. This is why it is so important that the Bible has future predictive prophecy because it confirms that it is God's word. God knows the future. God's the only one that knows the future. And God will always predict the future properly and accurately. So there's, uh, there's future prophecies in the Old Testament that were, that were mentioned that have already come into fruition to a T about when Jesus Christ came. And also there's future predictive things about the end times and how the end times were unfolding even before us that have been predicted 2,000 years ago. Um, so if any other religious text or book tries to do any kind of future predictive prophecy, there's a pretty good chance it's not going to come to pass, and it's going to sniff them out that they're not, they're not from, from the Lord. Now, it's interesting, uh, Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon did try to attempt some future predictive prophecy. I want to show just two examples of some of them that he got wrong. Um, in uh, the uh, This is actually in the Doctrines and Covenants, not in actually in the Book of Mormon, but it's another book that they use. Um, In 1832, he made these predictions. In Doctrines and Covenants, section 87, he predicted that a civil war between the northern and southern states would start a world war that would end in global destruction. Now, there was civil war in the United States, but it did not spread to all the world, and and the world did not end. There was another prediction that he made in, in Doctrine and Covenants in sec- section 84, verses 1 through 5, and he predicted that a temple would be built on the western boundaries of Missouri, and here's the key, before his death and before that generation would pass. That temple was not built in his lifetime or in the generation of the people that were, were there, and I was actually looking up what temples were currently in the westernmost side of Missouri. And in Kansas City, which is on the most western side of Missouri, there was a temple built. 
in 2012. His prophecy was incorrect. When you have any kind of future predictive prophecy that does not come to pass, the Bible says it is a false prophet. So based on those litmus tests that God has given to us, number one, God told us that what we're supposed to be looking for next is not a next prophecy, it's for Jesus to come back. Secondly, it talks about that when God speaks, it always is confirmed with miracles. There's no miracles that are happening in the Mormon church that are confirming any kind of prophecies that are giving. And then the third thing is, is that uh, with what is being said, if there's any kind of future predictive prophecy that they're uh, giving, if it does not come to pass, that is how you know it's not from the Lord. And so with him even putting future prophecy in his book has pretty much disqualified himself by God's litmus test uh, as being a prophet and being from the Lord. Um, for sake of time, we do not have, have time to kind of dig deeper into some of the, the beliefs of what they have. Um, there is, I, I do want to say this just kind of in, in closing, and the next week we'll, we'll, we'll kind of dig deeper in some of this stuff. And I, I really appreciate you guys hanging with me tonight. I know I was talking fast. I know I was going over a lot of stuff. Um, and I appreciate you guys hanging in it. Um, but uh, um, the thing that is interesting that when I was looking on the very beginning stages of the Mormon church, and I was on their, their website, I, I clicked on the link that talked about who is Jesus Christ and what do we believe about Jesus Christ. And I was reading through all their descriptions, and it sounded just like what we believe. Now, it was vague. It wasn't in much detail, but it sounded like if we were to kind of give a high-level overview of what we believe about Jesus Christ, it sounded exactly the same. Just worded a little bit different, but it sounded the same. I want to tell you that as we get in deep, deeper into this next week, they are not the same. It is radically different than what you and I believe about who God is and who Jesus Christ is. And what I found out is as I was talking with them is that they use the same terms that you and I use, but they define them in totally different ways. And so in the conversation that I had with them, they said, are you familiar with the plan of salvation? And I paused and I said, yes, but I don't think your plan of salvation is the same as mine. And after listening to them, it was totally different. And so next week, we'll look deeper into that. Let's pray and we'll be finished. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be here. I uh, thank you for uh, everyone being attentive and, and, and being, being able to listen. And Lord, I just pray that as we, we dig into this, this false religion, Lord, I pray that uh, we would see that there are people that are deceived, uh, people that do not know the truth. And so, Lord, I pray that we would lovingly have conversations with, with people that may believe this and point them to the true gospel, to the true Jesus Christ. And show them about how they can have hope in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that we just take the, the information that we have today and just use it as a basis and a ground, groundwork of understanding and how we can better, better reach those that are of the Mormon faith. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us and be with us as we go our separate ways. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention before I let you guys go. Um, Suzette's... Um, son-in-law is going to be here next week. Uh, he, he, like I said, he was a for, former uh, Mormon that has become a Christian. And last year, uh, he was part of writing a book about reaching Mormon missionaries. And he wrote a full chapter in that book. And he gave me a box of, all of, all, uh, of, of, box of books that he helped write. And next week, he's going to be here and he's going to uh, share 15 minutes of his testimony. Uh, and, and then I'll have a box of these books that if uh, he will give out for free. I don't know if enough for everybody, but one per family. Um, but we'll have those books and stuff next week too. But I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to hear uh, Paul come and, and, and give his testimony next week. So, all right. Good night, guys. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it.